people from the LGBTIQ community can and do think about suicide or have um, you know poor mental health for all the same reasons that anyone else can do and and will do. The reason we see higher rates is because of that external stuff. It's because of you know feeling like you can't come out to your friends. It's because of feeling that you know your family won't accept you or maybe they do actually reject you or kick you out of home especially if you're quite young if i feel like i can't be open about my sexuality when i'm seeing a doctor there are a lot of people who just will not actually seek help or they won't seek help until later on when things are much worse that's matt morris he's the chair of the south australian rainbow advocacy alliance increasingly year on year i'm seeing more trans and gender diverse people seeking support and wanting to chat with someone who's supportive and who gets them but from an advocacy standpoint as well standing up for and fighting for the rights of trans and gender diverse people is increasingly being where you know the LGBTQ community is needing to do better. Matt realised he's bisexual in his teens, but it took him years to work up the courage to come out. Fortunately, his sexuality was accepted by his friends and family, but that hasn't been the case for others he knows. My partner, Ant, um, or Anthony, he came out to his friends um, about the same age. Everyone he really cared about, who he'd come out to, turned their back on him. Matt's always felt called to help those who really need it. He's worked the phones for Lifeline and Suicide Prevention, advocated for the homeless, and was fired up to step into his current role after witnessing the damaging impact of homophobia and transphobia during the marriage equality debate. You know, there's always going to be a dickhead out there, but you know, if, if we're able to call people out on that stuff, and as a whole, as a society, if we're able to be more supportive and accepting of people regardless of their differences, it makes a huge difference. Welcome to Young Blood, an award-winning podcast on a mission to make the mental health of young men a top priority. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our platform to open up and share stories of what we've been through because we're not alone. Let's do it. Trigger warning, this episode discusses suicide. If you or someone you know is suicidal, please call Lifeline on 13 14 11 or the Suicide Prevention Hotline in your country. Matt, when did you first start thinking about your sexuality? Uh, I would say I would have been probably about 15 or 16. So I would have been in year 10. And I think for me what it was was of realising that I was both attracted to guys and girls. And, uh, and that was really confusing for me at first because it was like I felt like I needed to be attracted to one or the other. I couldn't be both. And it probably took a good six months to, uh, to kind of work out that, you know, that was actually possible. That was all right. And, and sort of settling on the idea of, uh, of bisexual as the label that fit best for me. Yeah. Mm. So did you feel like really it would have been easier or made more sense to be one or the other and you sort of had to grapple with not being gay and, and not being straight and sort of where does that put you? Yeah. So I think um, so in context, so this was the early 2000s that that was happening. And I think at that stage, the language was more around sort of gay and lesbian. And we were starting, you know, bisexual was certainly there. Um, but I think it was so much easier to sort of see it as a, as a binary thing of either straight or gay or um, likewise as well for women either being straight or lesbians. And um, for being bisexual, yeah, it, it took that bit of extra time to try and work it out. And, and likewise as well, does it mean that I'm attracted to both equally? Is it something that's different? Can it change over time? It sort of brought with it a few other questions. And in saying that you were attracted to men as well as women, mm. were you told, well, if you're attracted to men, then you're gay? By some people, yeah. Like, um, I've had it over the years where um, friends have only known me being in relationships with guys and... Um, you know, I'm not going to necessarily be promoting my sexuality as the the opening uh, opening thing when I'm talking to a, a friend or, or hanging out with people, and they've just assumed that I'm gay. And then when they find out I'm bi, they're like, "But you're the gayest guy I know." I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think they mean by that when they say that? Probably campest guy they know, um, and I'd even question that to some extent. But uh, but. Yeah, I think people have these stereotypes. They have these ideas about what it means to be gay or straight, and um, and they don't necessarily know what it means to be bisexual. And I think a lot of the time as well, you get judged based on the relationship you're currently in or how you're presenting. And the reality is, when you're bi, you know, 
you can, I mean, look, when you're anyone, regardless of your sexuality, you can present in any way. But um, if you're bi, you know, if you're in a relationship with a guy, people assume you're gay. If you're in a relationship with a woman, people assume you're straight. Mm. Um, and uh, if you're not in a relationship, they really just have no idea and they probably assume you're straight by default. What impression were you given as to how society viewed that when you were growing up? Um, I guess for me, it was actually more just about being attracted to guys in general, regard, um, regardless of whether that's as being gay or bi, when I started to realise that I was attracted to guys, it was really challenging. And it's why I probably sat on it for so long before actually coming out to people, because there was that fear of rejection from my friends, from my family. Um, and ultimately, I was really lucky. Like, not everyone's as fortunate as I am. Um, when I did come out to people, they were really supportive and accepting. But there was definitely that fear about that rejection or people just not being on board with it. And given that you are bi, did you think uh, in the early stages that perhaps uh, I'll just try to be with a woman because I'll avoid some of the uncomfortable things that might come with it? Yeah. So, I mean, my first relationship was with a woman. Um, and ultimately, that relationship didn't last too long. But beyond that, relationships I ended up getting into were um, actually by and large with guys. And I think that's probably why a lot of friends as well just assumed I was gay. Unless I actually said, this is the label I use, this is how I identify, you know what, I am actually attracted to women as well, even if I'm not in relationships with them. People just assumed that I was gay. Hmm. Yeah. And how did you feel about that while you were at school? What challenges did that present? It, yeah, I mean, I probably didn't talk so brokenly about it for a long time. Um, for me, it was just a matter of, you know, this is who I am. My friends accepted that. They were fine with that. And it was actually easier to just say you're gay. Um, mm. I think for those first five or so years in particular, it was a lot easier to just sort of say, uh, you know, yeah, I'm in a relationship with a guy. Oh, you're gay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Let's go with that. Um, so you used to you used to just say that? It was easier to just mm. sort of roll with that. Because inevitably, otherwise you have to get into the whole discussion and... Like, it gets into those, que those questions of, well, have you ever been with a woman? Or, you know, how do you really know you're bi? Or, you know, oh, you just haven't made up your mind yet. Which is pretty personal. Did you have gay people telling you that? To some extent. Actually, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the short answer is, yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, is that because people want you to fit in a box and adhere to one group in particular? I think sometimes, yeah. Um, I think as well sometimes people just don't necessarily get it. And and I can say that about both straight and um, gay people. That uh, and, and like I can say it about bisexual people as well. I think if you haven't personally experienced something, it can be hard to put yourself in the shoes of someone who identifies in a different way or has a different sexuality. Or likewise as well, if I'm going down a different road, has a different gender identity. Mm. You know, you don't necessarily get it unless you've actually walked in their shoes. And if you don't get it, there might be a propensity to say, oh, well, you're, you're wrong. You don't understand rather than me, the person who hasn't experienced, doesn't understand. There must be something that you haven't figured out yet. Yeah. But it's actually the yeah. opposite way around. It's so easy to think that the way that we see the world is the right way. Um, and I think we need to really open our minds up to realising, you know what, there are actually different ways of looking at things. And just because this is my experience of sexuality doesn't mean it's the same for everyone else. Mm. And the spectrum's so broad. Definitely. So what were you worried about with with coming out? Um, what we, did you think? Yeah. What were you worried might actually happen? So I think for me it was with both friends and family. So with friends... I think I can actually sum it up with both of them. It was that fear of rejection, that fear of people not being accepting or not getting it. And with friends in particular, it was that fear that, you know, they would turn their back on me, that um, I would lose this amazing group of friends that I had. And ultimately what did it for me was when another friend came out as bi um, and was really well rece uh, received and accepted by our friendship group. That's what gave me the confidence to do it. With family, I think growing up, you know, you would get the occasional homophobic comment or, or comments of, oh, you know, that's that's not natural and those sorts of things. And you kind of... Within your family? Within family. and Said in jest or seriously? I think, I think it was said out of naivety. It was said in the context of, you know, I don't get this, I don't understand this, this is different to what I'm used to, mm -hmm. therefore it feels unnatural to me. Um, and... My family were amazing, don't get me wrong. And when I did come out to them, they were really accepting, really supportive. But there was that fear for me that they might not get it. Or that, that they... would have planted those seeds in your mind. Yeah, 100%. On. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. So how long did it take before you did actually come out? So um, I came out to friends first. 
and that probably took a good six months of sit- sitting on everything um, and working it out. With family, it would have been a few months after that. And I think ultimately um, a friend's mum actually told my mum first and then she was trying to uh, get me to open up for about a month. She was, I'm dense as a door now sometimes, and <laughs> she was trying to subtly sort of hinted it that she knew that it was okay, that yeah. I could talk about it. And it was becoming more and more obvious. And I think it finally got to the point where I'm like, she knows something that I don't think she should know. I'm going to have to actually say something now. Uh, and she's like, yeah, I've known for a month. I'm like, well, you could have said something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even then, like coming out to my dad, that took uh, months and months longer. Because I, I think for, for my dad, I think there was really that fear that he wouldn't get it. And um, again, I was completely wrong about him. Like eventually, um, in my instance, what happened was my uncle actually ended up telling him. He was like, it, it's gone on long enough. He deserves to know. Um, and Were you a bit upset by your uncle for taking when, that away? When I was told that he'd done that, yep. And I, I was the way I was told was pretty much, your dad's in the car, he's driving around. He knows he wants to have a chat with you. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> a bit, a bit. So, you know, we sat down on the couch and um, and he's like, so I've heard that uh, that you're bi. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, so what, what, is, what does that mean for you? And uh, the way I explained it to him was um, I'm attracted to people based on what's up here in their head who they are, you know, I'm attracted to someone based on their intellect, their sense of humour, you know, what they're like as a person. Um, These days, like working with the LGBTIQ community now, these days I would use the term pansexual, um, that I'm attracted to people regardless of their gender identity. But in in those days, the language I had was bisexual. And um, I've just stuck with that label. But Dad actually really understood it. I think he got it what I was saying, and it's never been an issue within the family. Um, So for me, it was a matter of having that fear and uncertainty, and then ultimately uh, it ended up all being okay. Once the Band-Aid was ripped off, it was fine, but it's not always going to be that way for everyone. Yeah, and how much worse was uh, the the thinking about it and the overthinking about it compared to the actual reality? Much worse. Like for me, it was really a great source of anxiety and stress in that six seven months or so when um in particular leading up to mum knowing so uh, my parents were separated at that stage uh i lived with my mum and and my sister um i felt like my sister would get it but didn't know about mum so that was a real source of anxiety and um and likewise with my friends and um my best friend was the the first person i told and uh, i didn't have the courage to tell him in person so i told him um via a text message and uh and he said well, that's great as long as you don't try hitting on me. <laughs> I'm like, you're not my type mate, so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. So how did it bring you closer with your family? Um, I think it was really just being able to be a bit more open about stuff. Um, and ultimately, it was a bit of a, a non-issue. So life kind of carried on as usual. Um, it didn't really change stuff all that much. But you know, it, it was good not having to tiptoe around it and, and sort of hide that part of who I was. How was your current partner's experience different? So his experience was really different. So my partner, Ant, um, or Anthony, he came out to his friends um, about the same age. Uh, we didn't meet each other till our early 20s, but um, he came out around the same time that I did. And whereas my friends were really supportive and accepting, his friends did actually turn their back. Uh, their backs on him and that was really rough for him so by the time we met at about the age of 22 uh, keep in mind he came out probably about 16 15 he hadn't come out to his family he hadn't come out to other friends in the future he'd been very socially isolated and disconnected from friends through the last couple of years of school and um he was i mean look we were both really shy you wouldn't know it talking to me now but we're actually complete introverts but um He was so shy when we first met. And a huge part of that, I think, was because he had had everyone he really cared about who he'd come out to turn their back on him. Mm. And so that really shows you what can happen and what the alternative is and what so many people in that position do go through and that that fear is is real and and comes from a a real place. 100%. And it's, 
you know, it's why I say that I'm so lucky that my family and my friends were as supportive as they were, that I know firsthand from my partner's experience that that's not always the case. And again, in his case, when he did finally come out to his family after we got together, um, they were supportive. But um, again, it was a, a real journey for him because his first experience coming out with friends was so negative. He didn't want to take that risk coming out to uh, to his family and potentially losing them as well. And was that the end of those friendships? I believe so. Like I've never met the friends he had when he was at high school. I don't think he's kept in touch with them since then. So yeah, it, it pretty much ended the friendships. Mm. Yeah. And where's he at with that now? And people that he's connected to? Is it a different different life? Yeah. So um, he's. I think he's a lot more comfortable about who he is these days. And. Uh, Admittedly, we probably don't get out as much with friends as we used to, but um, with the friends that we have had over the years, they've been like, completely supportive and accepting. Um, many of our friends are from the LGBTIQ community themselves. Many aren't. Um, but the difference is that the people we surround ourselves with, uh, they get it and they accept it and, and, and they respect us for who we are. And it, it makes such a huge difference, like actually being able to see him, being able to be open and honest and and just having fun with other people without that fear just takes a long time to grow into that yeah especially after that initial experience being not what you want it to be Um, how much do you feel like being bisexual or pansexual has Mm. defined your young life honestly i think probably i want to say in my early years it probably actually didn't really define my life that gigantically um i think it probably did when i was working out who i was but after that um like really for me i'm a complete nerd so for me it was more a matter of just focusing on school going on to uni um and you know being a bit of a gamer outside of uh outside of school as well so you know it was more being focused on on friends studies um the things i'm interested in sexuality wasn't really a, a gigantic topic in my life um until years later when I became more involved in like working in the community service sector. But, um, you know, it's something that has always been there as a part of who I am. Um, and I think it's over the years that's become a bigger part of who I am. Mm-hmm. Mm. And what inspired you to work at Lifeline? Dad, actually, is the short answer to it. So I wrapped up a psychology degree um, back around 2007 and really, really, really struggled to find any work like um, I was working in a, a warehouse for a couple of years there and trying to get job interviews to get into the psychology field or counselling or those sorts of things. I started doing a counselling degree on the side as well. You know, this was right before the global financial crisis. So the the warehouse business that I worked for, sadly, um, they had to let myself and a couple of other staff members go. Dad gave me the idea of volunteering at Lifeline. I hadn't really thought about volunteering as a way of getting into work. I um. I just wanted to get a paid job and ultimately it gave me the chance to uh, really get some skills and opportunities that landed me um, my first job in the community service sector. But um, more than that was just an amazing opportunity to be able to support and work with other people in times of need. So you were in the call centre? I was. So um, I was in the uh, in the centre here in Adelaide and I loved it. Like I, I described it at the time and still do that it was like a, a family. The the people at Lifeline were absolutely amazing to um, to work alongside, and um, I had a real sense of meaning, you know, being able to support people on the phone as well. What did you learn about suicidality from working there? One of the things I learned about Lifeline in general was that it was so much more than just suicide. Um, that people would be calling us for all sorts of reasons, and. I guess part of it is that any of those reasons had the potential to lead to someone thinking about suicide if they weren't able to get support and weren't able to reach out for help early on. Um, And just the pain, you know, just the pain that people would be going through and how so often just one thing after another after another piling up over a prolonged period of time that led to someone thinking that this was the only option. And like no one wakes up one day and out of the blue thinks, I don't want to be here. It, it, it usually comes from a whole bunch of stuff that you go through that leads to that point. Was it a bit of a shock for you seeing firsthand how much people struggle just through day to day life? 100%. Like I, it made me really appreciate um, how fortunate I am 
and how fortunate I still am in my life. Like all the struggles that we would hear about at Lifeline, whether that's around suicidality, domestic violence, relationship issues in general, um, mental health, loneliness, chronic pain, you name it. You know, the, the things that people would call up wanting to have a chat about, it, it's everything and anything you can imagine. And being able to be there for someone in, in that moment is really powerful. But I think it also does give you a sense of, well, I hope other people and Lifeline feel the same way, but it gives you that sense of, of gratitude that suddenly it puts what you're going through in, in context and it suddenly doesn't feel as bad as what someone else might be experiencing. What sort of toll did it take on you emotionally? Um, I was really fortunate. Something I was taught at the very beginning was when you walk out the door, you leave it here. And that's, I think, a really hard thing to do, but it's an absolutely crucial thing to do when you're working in a sector like that, that you need to be able to... It, it, it sounds cold sometimes, but to be able to switch off, you need to be able to, to leave that stuff when you leave the room. Um, but, you know, you do debrief, you do talk to a supervisor, you do talk about what you've experienced on that shift because I think if you leave that stuff bottled up, even if you've, you feel like you're just leaving it at the door, you're going to take it home with you. And, um, you know, there are certainly stories that I, I still carry with me that I heard from people during my time there. Um and, you know, you need to find ways to, to not let it bring you down. Otherwise, and this is something that I shared with other people at Lifeline, that um, if you're not able to look after yourself, it's going to make it really hard for you to look after other people. And hearing from so many people in the community that were struggling uh, in, in such a way, was that what laid the foundation for you to start thinking about your advocacy work? I think at the very early stages, yeah. And I mean, flowing on from Lifeline, I became involved in the homelessness sector as well and, and working around domestic violence. And um, it was hearing these sorts of stories from people uh, who often didn't really have much of a voice to be able to speak up for themselves around um, around the real struggles they were going through. Because as you can imagine, you know, you're focusing on just getting through day to day. Um, work out where you're going to sleep that night, how you're going to have somewhere safe to stay if you're experiencing abuse at home or, or you know, if you're really struggling with your mental health. Being able to speak up for yourself can be really hard when you're, fo when you're needing to focus on your own well-being. So being able to try and be a voice for people as much as possible um, without diminishing their voice was something that over time I wanted to try and do more. And how did you go from homelessness into where you currently yeah. spend your time. So that was, um, I kind of feel like my professional life as a whole has been a series of uh, you know, fortunate accidents. Um, I I was asked to step in and, and backfill for a worker when, uh, when he went on long service leave and um, did that for three months in my current job working with the LGBTIQ community. And uh, 12 months later when he, when he left the organisation, um, I seemingly had left a good impression because I was asked to come back and, and work with the team again. And um, I kind of floated 50-50 between homelessness and, and uh, working with the LGBTIQ community for about a year before finally taking that step fully over to the new role. And, um, yeah, it, it was just a complete accident, really. Mm. Yeah. And what about the marriage equality bill coming in? Yeah. What, in, what part did that play in your, your passion? Yeah, so... Um, huge part is the short answer i so at that stage i was working as a community worker with the lgbtiq community and again you know being this uh this really sheltered guy who'd had a pretty uh lucky streak um throughout life and uh, i really can't emphasize that enough but uh hearing from my clients hearing from people i was talking to on the phone and in person that um, that they were really struggling during this postal survey, that they, you know, they had family who were suddenly really publicly debating the virtues of their marriage, uh, of their relationships, of their sexuality, of their gender identity as well. The fact that this suddenly was just such a, a publicly debated topic, you know, it had such a huge impact on people. And I actually felt really powerless about it. Like, yes, I'm one person who's there to provide emotional support and and assist people when they're really doing it tough around this stuff but I wanted to try and find an opportunity to do more and I think that's actually what was really the catalyst for me in terms of getting involved with advocacy um, which is something I continue to do outside of work on a volunteer basis um, and really marriage equality was it was the catalyst for me to to get more active in that space. So what impact did you see that have on people's mental health at that time? 
I mean, in the immediate moment, a lot of people just stayed in the closet. They didn't come out. They didn't talk openly because putting your head up, you know, putting your head over the the parapet, it was it was dangerous. You were potentially going to have people feeling you were, you know, you were fair game to have this really public debate with. Um, for Which other is kind people, of ironic because it's meant to be this uh, line in the sand that we're moving forward as a society, but they had people feeling more scared than yeah. ever to come out. Yeah, and like there are stats, there's research that like 80% of the LGBTIQ community felt really negatively impacted by this debate. I felt it as well. I was exhausted by the time we got to the end of it. Mm. But yeah, for some people, it was a matter they just stayed in the closet. They didn't come out during that time. For other people who were already out and open about who they were, um, they may have become a bit more low-key about it. For others like me, they became much more um, passionate around advocacy and becoming involved with social movements. Um, and for others, it was just really depressing. Like if you had this stuff going on at work or at school or at home amongst your family and people are debating the different um, sides of this argument, you know, ultimately this debate was around people's lives people's relationships, the validity of uh, their sexuality and uh, to the you know, to the extent their gender identity as well. And it had a huge impact on a lot of people that I was talking to. What examples of homophobia and transphobia have you seen that have been damaging? Um, I think, well, I mean, I'll start with transphobia and this was a, a bit of an ironic one, but um, I think for a lot of people, we don't realise how much it goes on when it's not targeted towards us. Mm. But one example was, I remember um, I was at a an event for uh, for a, a day of recognition around men's violence against women, um, so White Ribbon Day. Uh, and I'm wearing, you know, my White Ribbon T-shirt after this march. I'm kind of exhausted walking to the bus. And as I'm waiting there at the bus stop, um, off to the side I hear... Uh, this woman, you know, throwing transphobic, uh, transphobic slurs at a, a trans woman who's standing there waiting to catch the bus as well. Um, and, you know, just heckling her to the point that this, this woman just um, slunk away across the road to just get away from, from what was going on. And by the time I realised what had actually happened, you know, this woman's across the road and, and halfway down the block and I'm just standing there stunned like, do I say something? What do I do in this situation? You know, this woman, the woman who was throwing the abuse is there with her boyfriend as well. I'm like, is he going to hit me if I speak up and say something? What What do I do in this space? And um, I hate that I actually st- stood there and did nothing. But, um, you know, it it stunned me. It was the first time I'd actually seen transphobia in public. Um, and I think a lot of the time it, it happens without, um, you know, without cisgender people, people like us who, who are not transgender, um, we don't know it. We don't necessarily know what's going on. In terms of homophobia, you know, I've had homophobic slurs thrown at me based on how I'm dressed at times. Um, I've had it thrown at me over the phone um, when, you know, people might be seeking support from me and I'm not able to give them exactly what they're looking for right at the moment and they'll throw homophobic slurs at me through work. Um, you know, I'll hear it on the bus or, or on the street targeted towards other people from time to time as well. And... Um, I think of you know young people growing up in society hearing that kind of stuff when they might not be out and might not be open and the impact it has on them. But likewise, I, I think that for all of us, we, we need to acknowledge that this stuff probably actually goes on a, bo- a bit more than we actually realise. Where do you think that prejudice stems from? I think it comes from a few different places. Um, I think part of it does come from just not knowing better. Like If people don't realise you know, the impact of what they're doing. If, if they see it as you know, harmless, that's part of it. I think as well, part of it does come from what we learn from our parents or what we learned growing up. And it bleeds through. And it's similar to, to racism. It's similar to sexism. It's similar to, you know, ableism and attitudes towards people with disabilities. A lot of this stuff, we, we hear it as kids and then we end up repeating it. We're like sponges. We, we hear the stuff and we, we carry it on. And we don't always appreciate or, or realise exactly where it's actually come from. I think for other people, it does come from misunderstandings and, and from actual fear. And I think these days in particular, we see that towards trans people. There are these views that, that trans people, and in particular trans women, are trying to take away women's rights or that, you know, they're a threat to kids. And, and that's just a, a rehash of the old thing of, you know, gay people are pedophiles, for example. 
um, you know, these these sorts of attitudes are just so deeply harmful and and rooted in fear of they what are. we don't understand and yeah. yeah and stuff that's just not true at all. Like it's it's completely incorrect. And the reality is, you know, if you were going to ask me what's the gay agenda, what's the trans agenda, to be treated with dignity and respect, that's the agenda. And seeing what happened to that trans woman that day, did that fire you up? And knowing how you, you reacted and, and feeling a sense of shame out of the fact that you did nothing, although many people would react the same way because it's hard to know what to do. And yeah. It's just a, a, a normal reflex. Did that uh, fire you up for your advocacy work? Because you saw in the flesh, like, this is what's happening. And if it's happening in front of me, it must be happening it, all over the place. It made it more real. Like, it was stuff that I was already hearing from transgender people I was working with. Um, it was stuff I was already hearing from trans people I know in society. Uh, but suddenly, I'm actually witnessing it. Um, I'm seeing it in the flesh. And I think, again, you know, this sort of stuff, It people aren't going to do this stuff as much if a trans person is around their friends or is around someone else. They're going to do it when they're alone. Um, it's easier to get away with it if you know if the person is by themselves. So actually witnessing that and seeing that in public playing out in that kind of way, it made me realise this is actually what I've been hearing about all these years. And it did. You know, I, I think it, it does um, give you greater passion to, to really fight for the rights of people who... You know, I'm really downtrodden about that kind of stuff and to work with them about bringing about change. What do trans people have to deal with that, that no one else does? Um, oh, look, it's it's a bit of a list. I mean, um, people I know will talk about, you know, they won't, won't go to a public toilet because of the risk that, um, you know, someone else there will think they're in the wrong bathroom and will either, you know, call them out for it, verbally abuse them, possibly physically abuse them. Um I know people who are really afraid about going into public in general, thinking about whether they will pass, whether they can actually, you know, be seen in public as the gender they identify as, and again, whether they'll potentially cop verbal abuse, like that woman I mentioned before. Trans people will experience discrimination in the workplace, whether that's from colleagues, whether it's not being employed in the first instance, whether it's from customers or clients who um, who may have those views that we were talking about around transphobia. And I think as well, you know, some of the other stuff, like from an advocacy perspective, one of the big topics at the moment is around uh, access to healthcare, like being able to actually see a doctor. And someone told me the story just the other day of they went to see a doctor because they had a cold. And the doctor started asking them questions like, oh, wow, you're really tall for a woman. And... Um, things like that and and finally it got to the point that this person said well actually I, i'm transgender and then the doctor said oh well have you had surgery are you planning on having surgery when are you going to do that they literally went in because they had a cold and they needed to get a covid test mm. that was it um but actually being able to access inclusive health care as well is something that and it's not just here in sa but it is in other areas as well but you know, trans people talk about not being able to access healthcare to the same way that you or I would. Because they don't fit a certain category, yeah. I suppose. That's where policy comes into it. But just the stress of every moment of the day, whatever situation you're going into, having to consider that and think about that, it's just not something that the rest of us have to have to think about. That's uh, thankfully, it. it must be so hard. 100%. And I mean, I get it to a degree because when I go to a doctor, especially a new doctor I haven't seen before, um, and they ask me about my partner, I'll say, yeah, they're there, they're doing well, you know, our relationship is fine. I'm not going to say what my partner's gender is because I don't know whether that doctor is going to be homophobic, whether they're going to be accepting, whether they're going to ask a whole bunch of other mm. questions themselves. Um, it's easier to just, you know, keep it really basic and not disclose that stuff. So where do you think we're really at with equality and acceptance then if a man like you still feels like they have to not reveal that? Not that you should, but mm. obviously there's still a level of being being uncomfortable or, or being wary that, that people might not be all right with it. And of course, the, the vibe at the moment is now like, okay, gay people can get married and there's a bit of a, all right, we're all cool with it, maybe on the surface, mm. but how much do you think that's the reality? Yeah, um, I think it's a really important point. I, I sort of asked the question, um, let's look at racism. I mean, we had a referendum in the 60s in regards to recognition of Aboriginal people um, in the Constitution. And, you know, we've we've been talking about racism. We had, um, of course, Martin Luther King over in the US um, and looking at racial justice. We've been doing that longer than 
I've been alive way longer than I've been alive, and yet racism still happens mm. in Australia and around the world. We only have to need, need to look at the Black Lives Matter movement and stuff like that to see how racial justice is still such a huge issue. So I would say if that's still a problem, what hope is there that having marriage equality just four years ago, three years ago, is suddenly somehow going to make everything better? And um, Well, I think there's definitely hope, but it's not, it's not a flick of the switch no. thing, is it? Is it generational? I think part of it is generational, and it comes back to that stuff around uh, recognising that some of it will be learnt from one generation to the next. It is actually changing attitudes, and, and I think people actually having that visibility and recognising, oh, wow, you know what? Trans people, gay people, bisexual people exist and aren't scary. I think actually makes a huge difference to that stuff. Um, but I think part of it as well is, you know, calling stuff out. And again, coming from someone who used to work in homelessness and domestic violence, you know, calling out violence when you see it, recognising that, um, you know, sexism isn't okay. I think being able to actually call stuff out and, and get to a point as a society where we're able to actually, you know, hold each other to account about being respectful to one another is actually a really key way of bringing about that change. And it will take time. I'm under no illusion it's going to take time. We're doing better. We're getting better. We're not there yet, though. And you don't have to be an advocate to do that, I suppose. <sighs> it's just not perpetuating it within your own circle. Just understanding that those words do hurt and that perhaps ignorance just isn't isn't necessary at all. 100%. We all have that power. And I think it's really important as well to be really great allies. And again, you know, I'll, I'll take that example of... Um, you know, trying to be an ally in, in areas like racial justice and that, that, you know, as a white person, um, if I've got friends who are making racist comments, um, I've got a, a lot of power to be able to call them out on that and to hold them to account on that same sort of stuff. Same with sexism as well. Correct, yeah. yeah, yeah. As a man, I'm able to do that around sexism. And by the same merit, I think anyone is able to hold their friends to account or their colleagues to account. Or if you're in a position of power in a workforce, you know, a workplace, actually, you know, making sure that, um, you know, the, the, the people in your employment are actually, you know, talking in a respectful way, acting in a respectful way towards one another, towards customers, um, you know, actually calling stuff out when we're seeing it and when we're hearing it. What part does policy play in all this in terms of gay rights issues mm. and, and, and trans issues? How does what happens on paper and with legislation affect the way that society views and, and deals with this as, as a whole? I think it's a complex thing. And I think some of the stuff I've been talking about around... Um, you know, calling people out, that I see more at a social kind of level. In terms of policy, I mean, I think about uh, health policy. I think, you know, for example, here in SA at the moment, we've got the state suicide prevention plan being developed. Um, when I think about that as a policy, I think, well, okay, do we have visibility of the LGBTIQ community in there? Do we recognise that this is a community that's overrepresented in those statistics? And what are we actually doing to try and deal with that? So I think policy needs to actually recognise diverse communities as a whole. And I think if we take the approach of looking at policy through a one-size-fits-all lens, when, when doing a disservice to people who actually are from diverse communities and don't necessarily fit the mould of that one-size-fits-all approach to things. So policy needs to recognise diversity. And with those statistics being out of proportion for people within that community, why do you think that is? Is that just because of what they have to face more of uh, on a continual basis than others or from, from what you've seen, uh, what leads to that being the case? Yeah. And I mean, I can even speak from a personal experience about that. Like I mentioned before about when I was out of work during the GFC, um, I had times where I was thinking of suicide. And for me, it was simply because um, I felt worthless. I felt that there was no hope, nothing was going to change in the future. For me, it was because of not having a job and not feeling like a productive member of society mm. um, and a productive human being. Um, so I think, first of all, we need to recognise that people from the LGBTIQ community can and do think about suicide or have, um, you know, poor mental health for all the same reasons that anyone else can do and, and will do. Um, the reason we see higher rates is because of that external stuff. It's because of, you know, feeling like you can't come out to your friends. It's because of feeling that, 
you know, your family won't accept you or maybe they do actually reject you or kick you out of home, especially if you're quite young. Um, it's, you it's know, feel, I guess, feeling even more like you can't fully be who you are. Yeah. Or yeah. fully express yourself, which in suicide generally is is one of the major issues, regardless of, of who you are. It's that feeling of, I can't be 100% transparent with the people that I love or who are close to me because they're not going to accept me or it's going to make things worse and that sort of mentality i, I suppose maybe is, is perpetuated within that yeah that it's community. sort of it kind of feels like it's all the same old stuff but pumped up to another level and um likewise as well like with health services as i said before if i feel like i can't be open about my sexuality when i'm seeing a doctor um there are a lot of people who just will not actually seek help or they won't seek help until later on when things are much worse because of that fear that they might be turned away or discriminated against. And mm. if you can't reach out for help or if you don't feel like you can to uh, talk openly about this with your friends or with your family, it's going to make it so much harder to actually get it out there. And we know how important it is to actually be able to talk about stuff. So, so how accepted do you feel like members of that community actually feel? I think I think these days it is definitely getting better, especially for younger people. I think there is a lot more acceptance and support out there than people sometimes feel um, or fear that there, there might be more abuse. Um, but I think like, I use the example myself. If I'm walking down the street with my partner, I'm not going to hold his hand because even though 99% of people we walk past might be fine, 1% might hurl abuse at us. And I don't want to risk that 1% being the person in the audience or, you know, the person in the street who, uh, who sees us. Um, so I feel like... Why let that fear take that away from you? Because of the risk. It's, it's weighing up the, the risk versus the reward. You know, what am I getting out of holding my partner's hand versus um, what am I potentially risking by holding my partner's hand? Mm. Um, and, I mean, we're not big on public displays of affection anyway, but uh, I, I feel like it's it's something that a lot of people from this community think about and, and are worried about. And That cautiousness. Yeah. Because there's always going to be some dickhead somewhere. Yeah, that fear of risk and, and making judgments, making assessments about your safety and your ability to actually be open and genuine about who you are. So how does that change? Is it a time thing? I think so. There's always going to be some dickhead. There is. There's always going to be some dickhead. I think it, a part of it is a time thing. And again, a part of it is people calling it out. So, you know, if you're a bystander, um, taking it back to that example of me at the, um, at the bus stop, if I could do it all over again, it would be a matter of actually either, you know, going to the side of the trans woman and saying, hey, are you okay? You know, do you want to stand next to me? or possibly, if it was safe to do so, standing up against the person who was hurling the abuse, you know, actually being able to show that you're there and you're showing support for someone makes a huge difference. And, and for the person who is being abusive, you know, hopefully make them do a bit of a double take and think, well, okay, maybe this isn't acceptable. Maybe this isn't something that everyone just is on board with. Mm. And slowly, slowly, I suppose that starts to change. Uh, what, what do you see from the younger generations and what hope do they give you? Do you feel like we are progressing and that people are getting more uh, accepting and open-minded as the generations roll on? I think so. I think, um, I mean, one of the things that always blows my mind is when I talk to groups of younger people, their understanding of this stuff is much better than um, when I was at school or certainly much better than my parents' generation. Um as we have more discussions and openness and better understanding around diversity in all of its forms, I think it helps and it normalizes stuff. And that's a really positive step forward. And I hope that we continue to see these improvements generation by generation. And as you said, you know, there's always going to be a dickhead out there. But, you know, if we're able to call people out on that stuff and as a whole, as a society, if we're able to be more supportive and accepting of people regardless of their differences... Mm it makes a huge difference. It certainly seems like it's generally far less acceptable to be a bigot and people that are are very quickly called out for that and shamed for it. Whereas I think many decades ago within groups of, um, or men in particular, but calling that out and, and behaving that way was lauded or, or seen as funny or um, you know what people did who were living the right way. Mm. I think that 
seems to be, there seems to be less of that, but of course it's still present. Yeah, and I think um, I think where we're at now in terms of sexuality, I think we're in a much better space than where we were uh, even twenty years ago. In terms of gender diversity, this is something that we're starting to understand and recognise more in society these days. It wasn't really even on people's radars for the most part, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I feel like we've got a lot of work to do on that front. And, you know, for me, both in terms of my day job, like increasingly year on year, I'm seeing more trans and gender diverse people seeking support and wanting to chat with someone who's supportive and who gets them. But from an advocacy standpoint as well, standing up for and fighting for the rights of trans and gender diverse people is increasingly being where, you know, the LGBTIQ community is needing to do better. And, you know, from my perspective, as someone who's who's trying to speak up in that space, I'm also really keen to point out that I'm there as an ally. Like, there are times where I'm going to sit down and shut up because it's not about me. It's not, you, it's yeah. not about me. And the best thing I can actually do is really try and elevate and um, and promote the voices and the experiences of people who are actually gender diverse. And, you know, this is their lived experience. And if we can give them that platform, they will tell us what needs to be done. And, yeah, and they do tell us what needs to be done. You're part of that microphone. Yeah. What do you see as the future of gender diversity in Australia? I What I would love to see would be getting to a point where we realise that uh, gender diverse people are as amazing and different as anyone else in society and they can do incredible things. I know so many amazing gender diverse people and I want a future in Australia where the average Australian can see and acknowledge and respect gender diverse people for being incredible as they are. And I think as well, I also want to see a future where gender diverse people can really just be who they are, can receive support services, can access healthcare when they need it, um, you know, can get a job, can go about their life without experiencing transphobia or abuse. That's, that's my vision. That's beautifully put. And why are you proud of the community to be part of it and as a whole? I think one of the big things is the resilience of the community. I mean, um, seeing people who experience the sort of things we've been talking about today and, you know, still get on with life and do incredible things and stand up for their rights and for the rights of other people, that's empowering. Um, But likewise as well, I think just seeing people being able to be genuine about who they are and just live their lives, even if they're not advocates. And not everyone, it's, not, it's not for everyone. But seeing people just being able to be themselves and be proud about who they are is beautiful. Mm. And it's great to see you being proud of who you are. And, um, yeah, I hope we get to a point where you can walk down the street holding your partner's hand. Um, but I think for now it's it's incredible the work that you're doing to really make those changes on that level of um, policy and doing the the groundwork and helping to be that that voice for the people who don't have one otherwise it's just so important to have people working for those those groups um, at all times so that we can end up in a a better australia in a a better world so Mm -hmm. thank you for the work you do my pleasure and i think you know one of the things we were talking about last year in particular around covid especially in the early days was that idea of us all being in it together i think it's incredibly true we're all in it together and and that means all working together to try and create a better world um in our own different ways and it's the same principle for race and for sexuality or for battling a virus it has to be all of us and just because it doesn't directly impact you necessarily doesn't mean that you aren't a part of it and we can't just say oh well that's their problem we all have to contribute and sort of call out what is what is wrong and and promote what's right so yeah yeah, i think we'll get there (laughs) i think so that's it for this episode if you're getting some value out of the show please help us out with a quick rate and review on apple podcasts 
All our podcasts are recorded in video, so follow Young Blood Men's Health Matters on Instagram and Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Young Blood Media, to get the full picture. And please leave us a comment if anything resonates. We love hearing from you. You're more than welcome to join our inner circle by signing up for our e-news through our website, youngbloodmedia.com.au. And most importantly, please share this podcast with anyone in your life who might need it. We're all about reaching as many people as we can. A special thank you to our sponsors and our local business supporters who back the work we're doing. We're all in this together and we need all the help we can get. Until next time, this is Youngblood. Thanks for being part of the mission.